So it is the top of the hour. We're going to get started, uh, and we'll certainly uh, finish promptly uh, by 1 o'clock at the very latest uh, to honor your schedules. And, and we, again, really appreciate your interest in this topic. So uh, to dive in, and, and we're going to go through sort of a variety of things, but we're going to, we've got a, a fairly varied audience uh, on, on the call from educators uh, to uh, individuals that run business accelerators and incubators to uh, individuals who are responsible for uh, teams within a business environment, be that a, a corporate or enterprise type environment as well. So we're going to sort of get into this topic, but, but understand that we're trying to address it from uh, a variety of different, uh, what should be fairly parallel perspectives. So the topic is, huh, what did they say? And uh, it's really about how do we improve be it our student, our entrepreneur, or staff communication. And it's almost, you know, as, as I think about this topic, you know, we've, we've all been to whether it's, you know, at a networking event or, or within our own organizations, we've been uh, to situ in situations where we've either, you know, listened to somebody in front of the room or we've been talking to, to somebody who's, you know, just one-on-one -on -one communicating with us in front of us, and they'll talk for three or five minutes and we'll come away from that conversation still not very clear in terms of what they do. And uh, this is an exceptionally common problem, and it, and it really pervades all types of, of business communication. The idea that, uh, and I, that uh, some um, concept or idea that's in someone's head has trouble reforming in someone else's head is really the crux of uh, where uh, communication challenges lie. And so that's really where we're going to sort of navigate through today. And, and maybe uh, some of us have felt like this person at times where we're, you know, where we're just, uh, you know, obviously good communication has a variety of elements involved in it. There is sort of what do you say, that uh, uh, the content part and the substance. And then there's the whole uh, uh, performance, the whole ability to deliver it in a compelling way. So uh, you might think of that as form. And so the form and substance together are uh, what creates that transfer uh, as, as, as close to a facsimile as it can be from sort of what ends up, uh, or what begins in one person's head, head and ends up in another person's head. And that's, uh, again, kind of where we're, we're trying to aim this shift today. So we received, and thank you so much, we received uh, plenty of good questions from everybody as they registered. Uh, this is uh, some highlights, and we're going to make sure that we address these. Some we'll, we'll certainly get into as we're going through uh, the various uh, parts of, of this presentation. And anything we miss, we'll come back to uh, certainly at the end. We'll make sure that we, we close up real strong and hit, uh, hit your various objectives. So our agenda is, is fairly straightforward and simple. We're going to talk about the common challenges. How do we empower students, entrepreneurs, and staff communication? We'll talk about a variety of tools and techniques and systems. We'll certainly, again, address your questions. And then we'll finish up with the top three communication development tips, so things that we've learned sort of in our travels of ways to really sort of affect uh, how our uh, group or our, how our students or, or professionals are communicating. So just so you have a little bit of sense of, of uh, I guess, my background so that there's some context to uh, the points of view I'll be sharing. So um, uh, we started a business uh, a couple of two years ago called Test My Pitch, and we're growing quite quickly. And uh, we're essentially an online platform that helps improve individual communication skills. And we have uh, built private communities online, just like if you took the concept of Toastmasters and put it online. And we'll certainly talk a little bit about that later. And the goal of this whole workshop is not to be at all self-promotional, but just so you have some background. Uh, also, uh, is a part of building this business in the last 18 months, I've been to uh, over 150 pitch events and uh, presentations and, and a variety of different public speaking uh, type events. And so there's, uh, there's plenty of, I guess, of, of uh, uh, different good practices that we've seen. Um, and then 
I guess finally here is I'm an active community builder. So I do a lot of work where we're based in Connecticut, and I'm also affiliated, uh, and I'm a, what's called a champion with uh, a group that's called Startup America, which is a nationwide group of individuals who work on community building in the entrepreneurship space. And just a disclaimer, and this is true of any uh, certainly online webinar and, and probably any any type of workshop, is that you know the, the information we deliver, and again, we're trying to address sort of a broad uh, uh, set of interests and needs who are listening to this uh, workshop, is it, it probably is mostly appropriate in many of the situations, uh, but there may be some specific things we're not considering or um, some you know, sort of unique uh, use cases that would certainly require more conversation, and we're more than glad to uh, talk with anyone offline and really get into some specifics uh, that uh, maybe are more appropriate for your specific community or your specific goals. So uh, that said, let's pop into sort of our topic. And so we're going to get into talking about common challenges in actually two different ways. We're going to talk about them from the individual communicator standpoint, and then we'll talk about them from the organizational standpoint. And the, the two go together to really help us figure out what to do best to make uh, everything work well. So we're all familiar with this, whether it's uh, ourselves feeling a lack of confidence when we go to public speak, or us seeing it in others who uh, were uh, working to help. And that lack of confidence actually is an incredible inhibitor. Uh, and, and as we look at this, and, and maybe uh, the best way to look at this is there was there have been many, many studies about uh, fear that people have. And, and uh, maybe some of you have heard this, but there was a, a study not that long ago that found that our fear of uh, public speaking as Americans is actually greater than our fear of dying. And so, of course, that caused Jerry Seinfeld, the comedian, to say that we would rather be the one in the box than giving the eulogy at a funeral. Uh, and that's, that's really poignant in terms of trying to understand the challenge in terms of how important confidence is to public speaking. And there are a variety of issues, right? It's the, um, it's the confidence in what we're saying. It's our confidence in the ability to say it. It's our confidence that the audience is, is going to uh, respond to us and our message is going to resonate with them. So as we look at this, so let's, you know, just sort of going down the path of, of confidence or the lack of it being an inhibitor, our observation as we go to all these different types of pitch events all, all across the country is that the people that actually stand up to share their ideas are really just the tip of the iceberg. If we look at sort of the whole community that we're trying to affect. Uh, and so, you know, and this is whether, you know, it's in a corporate boardroom, uh, you know, sort of in a work environment, uh, or it's in an innovation space or, or in the classroom, the people that volunteer to stand up are a much smaller set of people than the people who um, who would uh, not stand up voluntarily to share their ideas. And so our, our real goal here is to flip the iceberg over. How do we find a way to make the majority of people very comfortable and interested and passionate about standing up to share their ideas or to communicate uh, what, what their intent is, uh, and, and ideally the, the much smaller minority who uh, still isn't quite comfortable. So uh, as we look at this, dealing with that uh, confidence issue is really, really key. So the second issue is the lack of comp confidence. It's that, that knowledge and, and ability to say what we intend and to communicate what we intend. So that really breaks down into two areas. Is our substance good? Do we have the right content? Is it aligned with what our audience's goals are? Because ultimately, it doesn't matter what, what we say. It's what the audience hears that makes a message valuable. And so it's, it's not, you know, it's, we can work on the script all day, but if it's not in alignment, then we're going to have a problem. And of course, the other is, do we have poor form? There are certainly people who have wonderful content, but their delivery is so bad that, of course, as we see in this picture, uh, they've lost the audience. And so 
we, you know, we, you can't, it's, it's not really about being great at one or the other. You have to be good to great on, in both of those, or your message won't, uh, won't convey. So again, we can have great content and poor form, and people won't listen, and we could have great form and poor content, and people won't listen twice. They may listen the first time, but they won't come back, and that'll be a real challenge. So uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, I think, really put it well. He said, all great speakers were bad speakers at first. And when, as I think of this issue, and in fact, at, at 1 o'clock Eastern time today, I'm speaking to a, a graduate class at the University of Connecticut. And one of my messages to them is that to pitch well, you have to pitch poorly. And, and the analogy I really think of when I uh, think of this is it's like cooking pancakes. And, you know, I've, I've, I've been cooking pancakes for 40 years. And, uh, you know, I've cooked, I'm sure at this point, thousands of batches. And um, I have yet to figure out a way to cook a good first pancake. In those thousands of batches, I know that every time I cook, you know, a batch of pancakes, the first one will be inferior relative to the second, third, and fourth. And so when I think of it, it's sort of like, in order to cook a good batch of pancakes, I have to cook a bad pancake. And I think if you look at pitching or communicating the same way, it's, you know, maybe that old adage of how do you get to Carnegie Hall, it's practice, practice, practice. And, and uh, communicating is uh, oral communication in particular is exactly the same way because there are so many skills that come to play in, in doing it well. So we've looked at the individual common challenges. Now we're going to look at the organizational challenges. And again, putting these together is really where we come up with the best solutions. So it, there are just a few items here. One is the, I, the notion of sort of uh, that there's limited pre-event support. So again, whether it's, you know, we have class presentations or a pitch event coming up, or there's some, maybe it's in the, in the corporate world, we have uh, it's annual budget time and, and people are coming in to get approval on their capital expenses, uh, whatever that might be. But in every sort of walk of life here, we're all, we're all pitching. And the thinking about the idea of how do we get people to be, able, be comfortable, number one, in sharing their idea, because there's risk when, at least there's perceived risk when they stand up, uh, that, you know, whether they don't want to sound, uh, you know, not uh, not exactly how they intend, or whether they are concerned about the validity of their idea. It, you know, ultimately there's some inhibitor there. But the idea that we can give people a way to practice in a safe and sort of collegial environment in some way before they enter the room will not only help those that are are sort of the the more outgoing, the more um, predisposed to standing up, not only will this help them perform better, but it will get more people, in essence, more innovation and more engagement off the bench and into the game and ready to participate and share their ideas and, and be a part of the process. So having, uh, having some strategy for pre-event support and practice, uh, and really practice uh, that makes perfect. Um, and again, we kind of talked about the iceberg, but the idea that this is all, all comes back to that idea of the iceberg. The better we are at this pre-event support, the more likely we are to flip that iceberg over and, and make the top, uh, the new top or the bigger portion represent those within the organization or within the class uh, who are engaged and, and the vast mi minority who are, are still concerned or happier about speaking in public. So the second issue that we see here, second, second challenge from an organizational standpoint, is quite often feedback is out of context. And so when, when you think about this, and, and so much of feedback in the communication space is oral. So somebody shares their idea with us, or maybe with a panel, or with a, a, a group, and, uh, and then the feedback uh, is given to, to them orally. So to think of this, so let's just imagine a situation where you, you're you working one-on-one -on -one with an individual and you give them feedback 
from your impression of what they just said. And so when they're processing that, they're not sure if you give them, let's say, for example, four different elements uh, that you have recommendations on or suggestions on or comment on, they're not really sure how to prioritize or weight those. And so while the, while the comments are valuable and good, and the point here isn't to discourage oral feedback, but it, is, it, is, it has a limitation in terms of how uh, valuable it is in, in, in terms of uh, individual, the evolution of individual communication skills. So let's make that a little more complicated. Let's uh, imagine that there's a panel of, of five you know, judges or uh, people reviewing these different presentations or communications. And maybe three of them give four comments to any given individual. So now it's even more difficult, right? I now am receiving 12 comments that I have no real way to prioritize or weight or understand the relationship of each comment to the other or within the context of the decisions that will be made. And ultimately, it's the understanding, the alignment that that individual has and in their understanding of how they're being reviewed that will drive the content that, and, and the delivery that they that they give. And so, uh, again, this idea of being uh, having feedback be contextual is is really critically important. So the receiver, again, it, feedback is really about making sure that the just like communication on the front end is about getting the right sense of, of the idea into uh, the audience's head, the feedback has to uh, sort of, if you will, penetrate uh, the receiver's head. So, you know, there are a variety of, of opportunities here. Number one, one of the things I see uh, challenge organizations is they're quite often the, the receiver of feedback hasn't been prepared to receive it. And so they might get defensive or, or, you know, a variety of things or just might not hear everything. And so there, I, I believe there are some training opportunities in terms of helping people prepare to receive feedback. We, we most organizations spend a, a decent amount of time preparing judges or, on, or um, uh, mentors to give feedback, but maybe not so much or, or if any time preparing the students or or uh, entrepreneurs or staff to receive feedback. And, and it's, it's absolutely just as part of a skill uh, to receive and internalize and action feedback as it is to give relevant feedback. So the third and, and, uh, and I would say final um, uh, point relative to uh, challenges that organizations have with regard to uh, evolving their uh, their communities uh, communication skills is sort of a, an, and this is going to be a little bit conceptual, so uh, stay with me here, is that the need to start at the beginning, and let me explain what I mean, is it's, it's amazing to me that pretty much in al almost any communication circumstance, there are no reference points that individuals have that instruct them on how to um, perform well at a given event or opportunity. And so let me give you an example of where this exists. So in running, uh, people that compete in, in running events have incredible leverage over uh, the experiences of past participants in pretty much any event, even the most benign turkey trot, there are incredible reference points as to how to perform well at the next turkey trot. And so, and this is true of, of much of athletics. There, there, is, uh, there are historical reference points that allow individuals who haven't participated in this event before to go and perform better than people who participated last time. So what does that look like? So there are results. Every single running event you could participate in, probably anywhere in the world, uh, somebody keeps track and keeps score and post the results. This information is democratized. Nobody's embarrassed by it. Nobody complains that it's shared. Uh, and in fact, whether you're first or last, you learn a lot from it. So people look, the runners look at this information really in three different ways. One is they, when, it, when it's available, and it's usually available the same day 
that they run the event. They look at it, number one, to see how they did versus their expectation. Number two, they look at it to see how they did versus reference points. In other words, people who they know and or respect, uh, and they compare their performance to those individuals. Let's say, for example, there was somebody that finished better than you did that you know. The most normal thing that a runner would do would be to go up to that person and say, hey, gosh, congratulations. You did really well. What did, can you tell me what you did to prepare? What did you, what did you eat beforehand? Are there, are there opportunities for us to train together? But they look for ways to model better performance and, in fact, ideally leapfrog it. But it's all done with a sense uh, of sort of reality. And, and, and again, those, those milestones or reference points or, or waypoints even. And, uh, and then the third place that, that ultimately really is, is the biggest leverage in this information is before you would go run an event, all of this information is available. And the most normal thing somebody does, even before they register to participate in the event, is they look at previous year's results. And they say, well, well, how do I need to perform to meet my expectations at this event? And they start thinking about how they would train, how they prepare, and they start sort of laying out the three or four month schedule, or maybe even longer, to get to a place where, they'll, where they'll, they will perform well at that event. And so the idea is, how do we create that same kind of, those same kind of reference points uh, so that whatever our communication outcome for our community is, that people can come in and up standing on the shoulders of past participants, that we no longer have to start at the beginning uh, with new participants. The new participants get to benefit from the experience of the previous participants, not by some orally delivered folklore, but actually by you know, actually seeing the paintings on the cave wall. And that's really what we want to pass on is this legacy of, of better and better performance. And so the argument that I'm sure is going on in some folks' heads is, well, gosh, running has hard data. You know, there's, there are these really you know, quantitative uh, reference points. So there, I, I acknowledge that, absolutely. The point here is there are reference points. And if you have a process that gives you both qualitative and quantitative feedback, and, and you give yourself an opportunity to evolve it, you're going to get to a situation where you have a, a variety of very reliable reference points for whomever you're trying to improve their communication skills of. And I'll give you an example. So, um, and actually we're going, uh, oh, sorry, we'll get to an example in, in just a minute. But let me, let me maybe just take one more minute on this topic. So when we look at, at these, I'm uh, sorry, I lost my order there for a second. Um, but when we look at these reference points, the real goal, if you almost look at it like you were in your car, and you know, right now in our cars, we have two sort of major areas uh, that guide us in terms of uh, how we operate the vehicle. One is our dashboard that has all sorts of instruments, a speedometer, an odometer, and all sorts of other things, our, our gas gauge, and you know, tachometer and, and all that. And we use them all to sort of at varying degrees. And then the other major reference point is the window. As you know, we look out the windshield, we look out the side windows, the rear window. We've, and, and they're really quite different in terms of the types of feedback we get from each. But imagine I asked you to drive your car and I covered up either your dashboard or your, or your ability to look out the windows. Could you operate your car? No, you need both of those reference points in order to operate your car well. If I just let you uh, uh, look at the dashboard and not out the window or vice versa, uh, you're very likely uh, going to have significant problems. You're either going to crash your car at some point or you're going to run out of fuel or get pulled over for speeding or going too slow or whatever it might be or not shifting your gears in time. All those types of reference points are really key. And this is really all about giving individuals data points so that they can, they can correct and also mimic better behavior. Um, so really kind of a key, a key value. So we've talked about the challenges. Let's talk now about uh, some of the solutions here. So, uh, and that's ultimately what we want to get to is how do we solve this? So 
What we've learned, uh, and there undoubtedly could be several other sections of this hierarchy, uh, but that there's really a kind of a hierarchy of communication learning. And so there are the things we can do by ourselves. There are the things we can do by ourselves with tools. There are the things we can learn by getting oral feedback from others. And then there's a, another level, which are the things that we can learn by getting qualitative and quantitative feedback from others. And so let's just hop into what this looks like. So with ourself, we can no problem at all work on a draft. We can practice. We can edit. We can repeat. But the challenge is we're doing all of this work in a vacuum. And, and so, you know, again, it gets us to a certain point, but it probably won't get us to Carnegie Hall. And, you know, it, nobody likes working in a vacuum, and there's, there are absolutely some limitations to how that works. So what are some of the tools? We can work with a, with a variety of tools, right? We're, we're you know, for, since, you know, the, the beginning of reflection, uh, there have been mirrors. We certainly can use stopwatches to make sure that we're within whatever time limit we would have. And, uh, and fairly recently, it's been very easy to create videos and watch ourselves. And I have to say that um, video is a huge leap forward in communication development. If an individual simply videoed themselves and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and then could play it back and watch it, they would do really, really well. And um, you, the, just the practice actually of videoing yourself without even watching it would really improve what you do. And, uh, and then uh, the whole idea of watching it, you're, you know, the challenge of the mirror is you, um, you, know, you, you can't play back the mirror. And it's very hard to analyze yourself while you're delivering. So coming back later and watching a video is, is much, much easier. And everything from our phones to our laptops or computers to our tablets all record uh, video very easily now and uh, you know, can be uploaded and all that kind of good stuff, uh, but very, very easy to do. So then oral feedback from others, really neat, because it, it, the cool thing about this is it adds another viewpoint. You know, besides yours, you now can get that kind of feedback from others. Obviously, we've talked about some of the challenges in terms of is, it, is the feedback as actionable as it could be, and, and, uh, and we'll find some, certainly find some limitations there. And so we've got, whether it's a panel of people or whatnot who are ready to give us feedback, or maybe it's just somebody who heard us speak who we catch on the way out the door in the hallway or, or whatever that might be. Um, so then the, sort of the, the fourth opportunity here is for qualitative and quantitative feedback from others. And so what we're really aiming at is that this is contextual because we have criteria, we have you know, sort of a methodology to uh, giving feedback, and, and everybody who gives feedback would be doing it in, a, in alignment with objectives, all those types of things. And, uh, and then by having that, the, uh, the feedback received is much more actionable. The idea of referential feedback, so that not only do we see how we did from somebody's point of view, but we see how others did from that same set of people's point of view, will give us even more context to how we can evolve. And, and so I'll share another experience with you about going to all these pitch events. Is one of the things we do, and, and there are some pitch events where you know, the organizers announce who wins. Uh, or some, you know, top three or whatnot, and there are other pitch events where that doesn't happen. Uh, in other words, there's no sense of how people did. So let's just take a pitch event where, where the organizer has a, a top three. And so here's a really interesting thing. It's our, kind of our normal habit. Any of, any of those types of events we're at is to, as soon as the pitching is over and the, the winner or, or top three is announced, our, the first conversation we get into is with the people who are either first, you know, first, in, first or first, second, and third. And the, you know, after we congratulate them, our question is, hey, congratulations. Um, can you tell me what, what is it you think you did that caused you to win or, or be second or be third? And 100% of the time, we get a blank stare. And in other words, we have no idea why we won. And so 
of course, then we asked that question of other participants who weren't recognized, you know, do you know why these guys won? And so there's, you know, they have no idea. And so, you know, the limitation on learning, the idea, the idea that we, are, we aren't reinforcing what somebody does really well that causes them to continue to do that, and we don't, and that we're not exposing people to what gaps exist in terms of communication opportunity seem very limiting. And so as, as we mature this, the idea that we can begin, begin giving people really good reference points will be very powerful. And that, that sort of final area within this is the idea that there are historical reference points where people that come into that program in the future, be it a class or be it an accelerator or be it, you know, into, the, into you know, request capital budgeting in their, in their sort of corporate boardroom, that they, they know what good performance looks like and they're able to prepare and practice in a way that allows them to exceed not only their own interests, but the expectations of the organization. Um, I'm going to stop for just a second. Somebody doesn't have their mute on, and we can, and we can hear stuff going on in your office. So um, if you wouldn't mind, if you're not speaking, just to put your phone on mute, that would be fantastic. So this is what, and this is what I was going to, thought I was, I was going to earlier, but this is what, uh, when we talk about sort of referential and contextual feedback, this is what we're talking about. So this is just a screenshot of a tool we have that um, actually shows, you can see the, the business names. Uh, in this particular event, there were uh, three criteria. And you'll see there, and there were five judges. So the scores you see are roll-ups of those judges' scores. And so, and there were, I think there were 11 teams in this particular event, but this is just showing the first three. Uh, but you'll see, you know, very strong qualitative or quantitative information and rankings and, and so on. And then you'll see uh, qualitative information. And so you have strengths and further to, to the right, you'd see recommendations. And um, the, and it's a, you can really, going back to that metaphor of the dashboard and the windshield or windows on your car, you can think of the, um, the, the numbers or the uh, quantitative feedback as your dashboard. This is telling you sort of, these are your gauges to tell you where you are, where you are in each of the key components of this communication. And, uh, and then the qualitative feedback is just like looking out the window. That helps you adjust to the information you're getting from the gauges. And you can't have one without the other. If you just saw the numbers, they wouldn't mean as much to you as they do with the context that can be provided by the, the text feedback. And if you just saw the text feedback, you wouldn't know the relative importance of each comment. So each one sort of qualifies and, and verifies the other. And again, a lot, and the goal is to allow very actionable um, activity from from this feedback, and uh, you know it's funny if if we were in any creative field, uh, we would have maybe gone to art school or whatnot. Feedback in in that in those disciplines is called critiquing, and it is so common and so uh, direct and and fulfilling uh, that it, it's just a very very powerful part of that process, and and in, we haven't matured to that level in communication development uh, to uh, really get people to that, that same level of, of quick evolution in terms of, of building uh, communication skills. And uh, so that's part of our goal. But it's so, you know, so here's, you know, kind of here's where the rubber meets the road, right? So people learn uh, really in, in kind of three distinct ways, sort of either visual, auditory, or kinesthetic. And most people on the phone uh, probably have seen this in some form. but so we're giving most of our feedback auditorily, but yet most people learn better visually. And so, again, we're limiting how that information is received. We're not aligned with our audience, most of our audience's learning style. And so and there's no reason why we can't, you know, sort of give visual and complement it with auditory or and kinesthetic. But my goodness we better start appealing to the visual side or else we're going to be continuing this sort of cycle of, you know, sort of starting up and starting at the beginning with every cohort, every class, every, uh, every group we bring through. And we're also just, it's, it's sort of like we're defining insanity. So 
uh, I'm going to share two tools with you that um, can really have some effect in this area. I, I, uh, I guess I, I qualify this up front to say my goal here is, is not at all to make this a sales pitch. They are our tools. I share them as examples uh, because, number one, I'm exceptionally familiar with them, and they were built specific to this use case. And But I say that um, so that you understand that my goal here isn't this isn't a sort of a sales presentation. We're more than happy to speak with anyone afterwards about and can answer any questions. So there, there are two tools we've created. And um, the first one is sort of the name of the company, which is called Test My Pitch. And the, the easiest way to think of it is, is just like Toastmasters Online. So we create private communities where groups, it could, it could be a class, it could be a cohort in an accelerator incubator, it could be um, you know, a, a, a corporate group. Uh, we work with some uh, sales and customer service organizations and professional uh, groups. Uh, and so it could be uh, communicating better in the corporate environment as well. But it, it's really about sort of having a, uh, a uh, intimate community where individuals feel, feel safe and collegial in terms of uh, developing and giving feedback on communication skills. So. I'm just going to share three screens on this tool so you kind of get a sense of, of how it works. So number one, and the biggest, actually the biggest thing that keeps people from getting feedback on their communications is confidence in their script. So the first tool we developed within Test My Pitch is a drafting tool. So what we're looking at is a screen that is essentially customized to a specific use case. Uh, and, uh, and so we have tons of templates, and the process is all very customizable to any sort of organization's uh, communication use case. But the goal here is, is to very quickly have an, have an individual fill out or answer these questions, whatever questions sort of appear in the, in the template they're working on. Um, and and the, the product of their answers is uh, essentially the assemblage of their pitch assets. Whatever their communication, uh, core communication elements are, all of this information flows to a text editor where they can then wordsmith it and, and create their first draft of the pitch. Literally, most pitches on our system are created in just a couple of minutes. So it's a really good way, very simple way, to get people engaged and get started sort of in the communication development process. Then once they've posted something, and again, it can be posted in text or video, they, uh, the reviewers, whoever is going to give them feedback, it could be their, their peers, it could be you know, mentors, whatever the case is, uh, those individuals, when they go to that pitch online, see a scorecard that is, again, customized to the communication goal. They, they respond to the different uh, criteria, adding comments where there are shortcomings uh, so that we make sure that people approach or, or reach uh, exceptional in each case. And then the individual can come back and see what the feedback is. So I, I now can look at scorecards from various individuals on each pitch I posted. And the goal is that once you get a few comments, then you create a new draft, post again, and get a new round of feedback. Because communication development is iterative. And, and as we exercise this muscle, we get better and better and better at it. And then our second tool, and sort of the, the thinking of sort of a, a, com a complete solution set. So test, the goal test my pitch is to get people to the front door, to the, to the whatever communication event that they're going to, to get them to that confident and competent. In other words, ready to perform very, very well. Score my pitch is just like what we saw in that running event uh, with the results. It captures the, if it, if it if you will, judge or panel and or audience sentiment about what was communicated. And it uh, captures essentially all that wisdom in the room, contextualizes it, and delivers it to the individuals as feedback. Or if the organization doesn't want to share that, at least uh, collects it for organizational purposes. But so this is what a sort of a judge ballot or a you know, a ballot would look like. So there's each team down the left. There are the criteria. You can numerically score and then add your strengths and weaknesses. We also have the uh, ability, one of the things we've noticed uh, as we see this data is that judges' uh, uh, scores, judges generally after the third pitch 
or communication in any event, judges get easier. They use the first few to set some kind of a baseline, and then they vary from there. So uh, what we found is that that can dramatically affect the ultimate ranking of uh, ideas that are pitched or any communication that's delivered. And so we've actually, the yellow columns on here dynamically calculate both the total and the rank. So if I'm deeper into this ballot, maybe I'm on the 10th or 20th or 30th pitch, um, I'm actually, no matter where I am, able to see where this particular team or person, that where their communication is ranking relative to everybody else. So I'm able to actually uh, give a much more powerful relative ranking than I would otherwise. And, and ultimately, sort of any of any of any communication feedback, it's really all about relative ranking because everybody around us are reference points in terms of our evolution and how we uh, develop our skills. So and then this is, we've seen this, this is what the results actually look like. And again, the idea that this could be shared, it can be shared individually, you know, or all the way to being uh, sort of democratized, just like a, a running events results might. And our suggestion here is, you know, if, if results aren't shared today, or if this type of feedback isn't shared today, you know, without some education, it's probably not a great idea to, to sort of rip off the Band-Aid and share it you know, sort of broadly. I think it's really sort of a, a continuum or, or a process to get to this place where you create much more of a transparent and open process. But this will be where you have the greatest effect as you can evolve to this kind of situation in terms of share, sharing and democratizing this feedback. Again, it becomes incredibly guiding to uh, not just the people involved, but anyone who would be involved in the future. So lots and lots of information. Um, what we're going to do is pop to your questions, and uh, then uh, I'll open it up for any other questions that uh, have come to mind. But let's let's pop into your questions. And again, I'm, I'm just sensitive to time and making sure that we uh, accomplish what you all are aiming to. So I'm just going to pop down this list. I think there were nine questions, four of which were about uh, you know, sort of team communication development, and the other uh, five, I believe, were about the individual communication development. So the first one is, how do I get people motivated to stand up and speak? And uh, so when, as we look at that, the, you know, the, the real goal is, is to find ways to create safe and collegial places, uh, whether, you know, that right now, you know, some organizations do this in terms of in-person events. What we're seeing is that there's a much bigger audience that won't even show up to the in-person events uh, to e even observe others because they don't want to get called on or uh, or whatnot. And so uh, the opportunity certainly is great in terms of doing live in-person practicing, and, and I think that's great. But a, another way uh, to maybe engage even bigger audiences, and, and really on both sides, because when you do something online, you can not only engage people who maybe the timing doesn't work for of your in-person and live sort of practice events, but you can engage people that aren't available at that time or less comfortable in that environment, and they, are, they can you know, sort of prepare to, to be more comfortable in that environment. On the other side, you can also engage people who would be good at giving feedback who can't make that time or aren't geographically convenient. We have a lot of universities that use our platform first and foremost to de develop student skills, but also to re-engage just an alumni and uh, to find ways to get those most effective and valuable alumni uh, engaged with, with the students. So uh, what are the best ways to develop team speaking skills? Um, yeah, I, I guess I don't know of a better way than, than to, to have regularity in terms of, uh, and frequency in terms of how often people are standing up to speak, uh, the, um, actually, we we've heard a lot of interest uh, in in, in uh, just so uh, who's ever on the phone knows you're um, there's someone who doesn't have their mute button on, and we can hear some activities uh, in your office. So if you could hit mute, that would be great. Um, but one of the goals we've heard quite a bit from uh, folks that we're working with is the the limitations that there are quite often in terms of giving feedback within whatever time constraints most organizations have, and the idea that you could virtualize some of this uh, and, and create some efficiency and engage more 
individuals allows more iterative development, which, again, is really what communication is about. The, the challenge of communication ultimately is that it's, it's a combination of so many different skills. So you almost think of, of you know, sort of, uh, you know, training in terms of physical training. It's a lot like that. And the more you practice, the more you're able to, to do well. So the third question is, how do you get entrepreneurs to understand that their business model is very a very important part of their presentation? Um, at the, you know, uh, we found that, that sort of using a templated drafting system helps people build much more balanced communication. And so the, the challenge is, and it's not just the entrepreneur, it's, it's the, uh, you know, the professional who's fixated on the capital expense that they want the company to invest in. Uh, ultimately, the company's biggest concern is the return on investment of that capital, not the shiny new machine, just as the entrepreneur, who more often than not is, is more passionate about the, um, the, you know, their innovation than they are about the business model that will make the return on investment for their investors. So it's, it's really about, you know, I think getting a system where it's much easier for people to, to draft balanced uh, presentations or pitches whoops, and uh, and moving from there. So uh, what type of language, vocabulary, and tone uh, to use to speak to students, entrepreneurs, and staff? Um, yeah, uh, the more direct you are, the better, I think. The, you know, and, and, and I, I had mentioned earlier the, the sort of notion of training people to be able to receive feedback. Well, to me, this, that's where this all starts. And so helping uh, people understand how to receive, process, and internalize the comments that are given to them uh, is is really key. And and I would you know that's where I would focus first. And the, the language world will evolve uh, out of that I think really really well. Uh, focusing now on sort of the individual uh, questions that we received, how to speak their language uh, so that they will not only hear what we say but listen well. So. Uh, there's, a, there's sort of a concept, uh, and I wish I could say this was mine, but uh, I, I'm stealing it uh, from someone else. And a friend of mine calls his, what he wants to have happen in the first 30 seconds of any sort of pitch he's giving is he, he wants to deliver what he calls the dead seagull. In other words, he wants to have people be aware and, and acutely aware of the problem that he's looking to address. And, and one, not from his, that awareness of it, not from his perspective, but what it, how, what and how, or how it challenges his customers or uh, the people he's trying to serve so that the audience that's, that's listening to him, that they see that dead seagull covered in oil from the, the that oil spill, they know exactly, uh, exactly what he's trying to address, and really the value of it to his customers, how much his customers want that solution. Um, how do we understand the listener's filter to get a message clearly through it? So um, I'll throw out one other uh, sort of point, and that is uh, listener's filters are um, they're everywhere. And probably the easiest way to get through those is to know your listeners. Uh, most people envision that their communication starts when they take the microphone or the stage, and uh, and that's not the case. The communication starts uh, when when you enter the room or when you're able to make first contact with the people who are going to be listening to you. And so, the more that you understand their interests, needs, perspectives, the better you're able to communicate not only a message but in language that will resonate with them. And so, the message, sort of simple message, is when you enter a room to make a pitch. Um, come to the room, number one, early. Come prepared so you're no longer tweaking slides or what you're going to say, and so that you're able to spend time connecting with people in the room and learning about them. And as you learn about them, the most natural thing that will happen, number one, is your mo the most important thing is you're going you're to learn about them. Again, getting a sense of their interests and perspectives and what brought them there. That will allow you to adjust your scripts and your presentation to meet them. The other is, is that as you find out about, about them, the most natural thing for them to want to do is to find out about you. So you're going to have an opportunity essentially to deliver your pitch twice. Uh, and you may not do the same pitch or all the parts of the pitch 
both times. But the, the, the notion is, is when you actually stand up to give your formal presentation, you're going to have some champions in the room that actually are already on board and are getting what you're talking about. You're going to have, you're going to have nodding heads. You're going to get more intelligent questions, all those kinds of things. But it's a very powerful thing to spend time getting to know people in, in the room before you, uh, before you speak. Uh, how do you create clarity when communicating? You know, I think that the biggest thing that we've seen uh, change an audience's understanding, and I'll take it from two perspectives. One are the words you use, and two are the visuals you use. So the words you use, the simpler they are and the more direct, the less, uh, and, and in fact, the, the more absent they are of any jargon, the better your uh, message will transfer and be received. And the same thing with the slides. The simpler your slides are, the more visual they are and the less text uh, they are, the, the more likely your audience is going to be to follow your message. What you're really trying to do is take people on a journey. And the more that you can get them to, to hop on that journey, the better uh, you're going to do. The goal of, of any presentation uh, is generally not to make the sale. It's to create questions in a conversation. And so it's how do you, uh, and I say make a sale sort of a general term, but it's really about how do you create interest in conversation, and, 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 and that happens best when people come on that journey with you. And if you think of the most effective speeches over time, um, number one, they're exceptionally short. Two is there is the simple, simplest language, and the themes recur and reinforce each other. So it's, and, and, it, and they build essentially to a crescendo, but you, you go on, you hop on willingly this incredible journey that the order gives you. So how do you really get people motivated in the fir first 30 seconds of talking? Uh, the more you know about them, the more you can create a connection, the more you can deliver and show that sort of dead seagull so that it's of interest to them, uh, the better you're going to be. Um, and then uh, how long is uh, too long when you're pitching? Uh, you know, that really depends on the event and your audience. Uh, so the more you're aware of and sensitive to the needs of your audience, I mean, the most natural and first question should really be, how long do I have? And if it's five minutes, then you know, five minutes may be appropriate. If it's a situation where you want to entertain questions, then taking whatever time is provided and maybe cutting it in half or, again, adjusting it so that you make sure there's plenty of time for questions. Because, again, it's not what you say that's important. It's what your audience understands that's critical. And so if you don't give them time to interact, you may not satisfy their need. And, and ultimately, the uh, a communication that doesn't satisfy the audience's needs isn't really a communication. So uh, it's really about how do, you, how do you get to that place. So the three top communication tips, and we're, we're almost to the, the finish line here. And these are things that we found to be really, really powerful. Um, so first is to create pathways or on-ramps to anyone in your community who you want to get in to have that first experience. And again, this is true whether it's in the university setting, whether it's in the entrepreneur setting or in the corporate setting. It's creating some way, some easy way, for them to get that first experience and sort of getting them in. The second is to, when you're giving feedback or when you're, you've developed that system to give feedback, is first focus on how do you build their confidence and their form. In other words, their ability to deliver. What is sort of that uh, compelling uh, delivery and, and you know, are they speaking loud enough? Are they speaking slowly enough? All of those things. Then after that or after you're you know, fair ways down the ramp in terms of uh, getting stronger confidence and better form, then is when substance comes into play. And this really analogizes well to how people work on their physical fitness. You know, they, they, every, any trainer you go to, if you go to the gym, you know, if you haven't been in a while, their focus, their first focus is to help you understand the technique. The second focus is to help you lift more weight. And, and whether, you know, if you're a runner, it's going to be first, how do we get your stride right? And then let's work on how far or how fast you're going. But the first thing we want to do is make sure you don't hurt yourself. We want you to come back tomorrow uninjured and ready to go. And that's, that's really where we're going. Um, and, uh, and the third is 
to uh, find a way to offer contextual and referential feedback. So how do you create a system where, again, we give our, our students and our entrepreneurs uh, and staff more ability to understand how to perform well and, and how they did when they did perform and, and, and how they could continue to evolve their skills and, and, and not only from how they did sort of individually, but how they did versus whatever their peer group might be. So, wow, that's a lot of information in a really short amount of time. Uh, we do have uh, a couple of minutes, and I want to make sure uh, I open it up for uh, any remaining questions that we didn't address or any comments anyone has. Uh, so if you, if you like, please feel free to take your phone off mute and uh, share a thought or a question. Well, I'm going to assume I either did such an incredibly good job that all the questions are answered, um, or, uh, or that we have some, some folks that may be bashful. I doubt it's bashful. Uh, hopefully we did a, a good job. But um, what I want to do is just uh, share uh, contact information and encourage you to uh, certainly reach out to us with any additional questions. We're absolutely, totally committed to helping uh, organizations develop uh, the communication skills of their community, and uh, and certainly if there are things that we can do to help uh, any of you, we'd, we'd be more than glad to do it. You see my email at the bottom and my phone number. We're going to reach out. Um, it may not be till tomorrow, but just with a follow-up survey from this call. And we certainly love your feedback on uh, how this uh, worked for you and, and also any other topics that would be beneficial for you. So with that, I'm going to say uh, goodbye. and. I wish you all a great day, and, uh, and, and please reach out to us however we can be of assistance. Thanks so much, and uh, great communicating. Bye for now.